populations have been declining in certain areas for the last few decades, and as the years go by, there's more and more areas around the world with falling birth rates. Our total population is still growing, so most of us haven't really thought about what that means to our species. Only economists and other people into money have spoken up about this. Oh, and uh, people really into uh, certain sequences of DNA. However, the 8th billionth person was born recently, and we're well on track to cracking 9 billion in roughly a decade or two. So how are these two seemingly contradictory headlines possible? Well, it's because people are being born in the wrong place. Oh, oh god, that's terrible. Let me rephrase that. So, the countries quaking in their boots over less meat for the meat grinder, I mean countries that are worried about their economic outlook, are wealthy, or on the cusp of being wealthy, or in the worst case scenario, a few individuals in the country are wealthy, and the people are just not poor enough to lack access to birth control. Of all the countries that are rockin' and rollin', we're in extreme poverty recently, and most of them are in extreme poverty today. You may ask, why can't we just take the big families and put them in an area desperate for labor so that their economic output is greater, and the host country's output is greater as well? And the answer is, it's those dastardly DNA sequence fan. They think certain soil locations are important to DNA strands or something. I don't know, nationalism is weird. But even if countries allow immigration, roughly every country on the planet has a declining birth rate, regardless if it's lower than one child per family or seven per family. And demographers project that within the next few decades, every country will have a below replacement birth rate. Yes, every one. Even the country your country jokes about breeds like rabbits. They too will have fewer children regardless of how many fictional children they have now. This is inevitable. Or is it? Is humanity destined to have fewer and fewer humans until basically no one is left? Although the trend for every country is fewer children, this doesn't mean countries haven't successfully increased their birth rate in recent history, a trend to the point that they had an escalating birth rate over several generations, but many countries have been successful enough to tamper down the decline. So, if we could take all of the most successful policies of every country and then mix them into the perfect environment for children, we could determine if any country can get out of the child-free spiral. So let's list the potential conditions for declining birth rates, and then one by one see how we can address them. One of the most common accusations are that smart women refuse to have children. Another one is that everyone says kids just kinda suck. Another one is that people just don't have time for kids. And they also don't have the space for kids. Another one is that people just have a general anxiety about the future of the planet and wonder if bringing a thinking being into this world is ethical or not. But the most important factor, of course, is money. So, let's begin. One of the biggest factors that demographers and fertility hobbyists like to bring up is when a country improves the education for its women, the fertility rate of the country goes down. Therefore, education drops the fertility rate. So what are they teaching these females that stops them from spawning more goblins for the machine? Is it timetables? Is it mitochondria? Must the country excuse all of its girls from the classroom when discussing the powerhouse of the cell in order to preserve its economy? What arcane secrets only whispered in the halls of high school that convinced children are gross? Damn you, Great Gatsby! Release the minds of our daughters! It turns out, there isn't one piece of knowledge, aside from sexual education, that teaches girls to have fewer children in their lives. While I understand why scientists cite the education as a factor in child decline, it kind of becomes a misunderstanding when knuckle-dragging apes such as you and I read these facts. Because, if education was at least one of the many silver bullets, it would show in the data. There'd be studies where young girls enrolled in a particular curriculum in a particular country 15 years ago suddenly had fewer children. And countries that did not have that curriculum lacked the stark drop in family size. But that's not true. Although children around the world do learn generally the same things like mitochondria and how to spell neighbor, the way ideas are taught are so wildly different that education can't specifically account for decreasing fertility rates found in every country in the world. Now you may say that specific topics or curriculum aren't dropping fertility rates, but just general intelligences. Basically, you're saying the movie Idiocracy is a documentary. 
but that again would show in the data there would be studies where IQ scores or test aptitude related to fewer children down the line. What the data does show is that women with higher education have fewer children, and it is our conflation that in order for you to go to college you have to be smart. The answer is that women who go to college just have fewer years to start a family. Although it does happen, women generally don't get pregnant or married when enrolled in college, so they can focus on their studies. And then after they graduate, they can focus on their careers so they can get the value out of their degrees. This delay causes women to have less time to have children, and therefore fewer children overall. Because while women could have kids into their 40s, most of them say they don't want to deal with that because your 40s are a special time where you discover the limits of your body and have night terrors over your mortality. You don't want to have a baby while you're crying during your harrowing slumber. And if you still want to battle me on higher education is changing the family patterns of women, need I remind you that in industrialized countries, women with some or no college education are also having declining birth rates. Just because it's higher than college educated women doesn't mean it's going down. Another point is this smart girl, no kid thing is more about women's empowerment than their knowledge. Even then, it isn't like the more empowerment a woman has, the fewer kids she creates. Because in countries with more female representation in government, knowledge, and corporate power would have fewer children. But take Japan, which has nearly no women in positions of power and economic power, yet has a lower birth rate than nearly every European country, which generally all have more equal standards between the sexes. No, this women's empowerment is more of a threshold. A very, very modest threshold to pass for any developing nation. Basically, it amounts to, can a woman of this country do something with her life other than be a farmer, prostitute, or mother? If she has the ability to choose to move up to a city and work in a textile sweatshop, congratulations, that country has crossed the threshold. Although more empowerment for women does seem to associate with lower birth rates, it's not a one-in-one -one correlation. Otherwise, oppressive countries like the Persian Gulf states would have never-ending baby booms. And the Gulf states are the best proof against education and empowerment for women specifically being the reason for fertility decline, even though they are improving the standards of women too. There just isn't a country that gets wealthy, yet prevents all education of their women, and at least provides slight improvements to their empowerment at the same time. While obviously oppressive, the Gulf states aren't as bad as the Handmaid's Tale. Again, this threshold is modest. So, if a country passed policies to hamper their women's freedom and education, they would have to do so in a way that removes them entirely from the workforce, which reduces the country's workforce by roughly half, which is the problem they were trying to address to begin with. Basically, a government should not disenfranchise its women to trap them into baby-making because it will destroy their economy and hope for the future, and as we'll learn later, money and hope are really important for potential parents. Babies, a bunch of good-for-nothing freeloading buggers. They poop and cry and ruin your sleep and patience, and their hands are either sticky or moist. The two worst adjectives when describing something you grab onto. Full disclosure, I have children and they're great but I would never use my anecdotal evidence to advise people to have children. As a matter of fact, understanding what it takes to be a parent has taught me that children are the most serious decisions you can make, and not everyone can handle the permanent commitment to them. But this section is not going to be about what I think you should do. This section is going to be more about what society is telling you to do, and not just what the weird billionaires or geezer politicians are saying. I'm going to go with what society is asking you to accomplish in life, either directly through policies or indirectly through suggestive media like commercials. So I just quipped about politicians, and most of them are in favor of a larger family size for their citizens. Most governments encourage extra kids via policies and open stances, so I'm going to say that they can do more to tell you that it's a good idea. But cultures around the world really don't. Advertisements, media, and social media betray an ideal world in which you have the money to express who you are, with the wealth to socialize for inflicting that expression on your friends and family. Additional portrayals of the good life have to do with relaxing in a faraway oasis or adventuring into a new culture. The media we consume unequivocally states that the good life you should be chasing after is one where the journey is about you, or you and your lover. It's obvious the actors and aspirational media are childless, or the children are irrelevant to their life. Even in non-aspirational media, children are hardly seen to be a part in their lives at any point. But I'm not going to fault media for not adding children when they're inconsequential to the narrative. 
I mean, child acting is a complicated process with rigorous and necessary rules. And honestly, I don't think it's good for children to be actors until they understand what is work and what verisimilitude is. But we can fault them for when they do portray children, which is either a point of your sacrifice or a point of your annoyance. How many shows, games, and movies throw an innocent but important child with a grizzled adult that hates them in the beginning? only then to grow to love them, then die for them. I'm sure you see a movie with random grown-ups and random kids, you can predict the grown-ups are gonna die. Or if you're seeking a comedy with kids, the kids do nothing but piss off the grown-ups until the grown-ups are Stockholm syndrome into loving them. Kids are an annoyance and stressful, but they're more than that too. Children can make something as simple as folding clothes a rewarding family activity, but ask yourself, if you saw a commercial where some bloke shows his kids how to fold shirts and everyone's having a good time with it, you'd probably roll your eyes and call it sentimentally cringeworthy. And why do you feel that way? Because you expect your media to portray children as little booger demons that suck your life force like the advisor from The Lord of the Rings. Now, could a country address this? Well, they could, but I don't see how it would be effective. They pass laws that limited the speech of most media, then the media producers would just find ways around it. Like if a law said movies can't show a bad child, movies would just never show children again. What they could do is offer money to media that tries to portray family in a positive way, like giving filming tax breaks. That could work in a tiny way, but they're still up against the rest of the world's media that expresses pessimism and child rearing. Maybe they can't show that parenthood is easy, but they can at least encourage stories where creating a large family is a noble goal. It could be positioned as, sure, you never saved the world or cured cancer or got rich, but maybe the 25 well-adjusted children you spawned might, and then you could ride on their coattails, huh? Huh? Kids are like moldy meat, they need time to grow. They need time to bond with their family to form proper connections and become well-adjusted adults. On top of that, spending time with your children is a rewarding experience. Some of the time, some moments are spent just trying not to let the little runners die of hunger or get hit by cars. Estimate states that it takes at least 100 hours a week to raise a child, or 11.5 or 2, or whatever. The number of hours you must spend with a child varies wildly, and my research just shows that no one has a right answer. So let's hyper-generalize and say a full-time job. But guess what? The average couple both work full-time jobs too! Oh, jeez. So where do all these extra hours come from? Sleep mostly, and friendships, and relationships, and hobbies, and quiet moments. You know, all the things that make life worth living. Children will take up that time, and don't believe the parents that say having more kids gives you more time because they play together. No, that's a lie. For every minute the siblings do play together, there's ten minutes they're competing for your attention, or one is getting into trouble while you attend to the other one. If this play together thing was true, parents wouldn't be gatekeeping other parents by shouting, You think this is bad? Try living with three kids! That being said, if you want more kids, then have at it. The real crime here is that parents need to give up time with their family to work. How can you be the best parent you can be when five days a week you're burnt out from the BS of working? And while governments can help out a little by offering money to stay-at-home parents, I doubt they could ever offer enough to replace livable wages, and even if they did, companies would giggle as they raise the price of kid essentials to squeeze a few more bucks out of us. Thus requiring people to work more, thus robbing time from their families, but now the government is in debt. The only real fix is to force companies to reduce the weekly working hours, but still pay the same. Um, maybe we can do five or six hours a day, or maybe four days a week. I get that things need to be done, so I'm not asking for much. Kids need less space than one might think, because every babushka has a story about how they grew up in an outhouse with eleven brothers and sisters, and their parents still had the space to make a twelfth sibling. But I'm sure that sounds like hell on earth for most people. So this is going to be more about how many square meters are needed per child to make the entire family comfortable. And that number is different for every person. Some people are fine sleeping on the couch while their little horde takes over all the bedrooms. Some people refuse to have children share a room because that's communism. It's whatever. But what's not whatever is the fact that house prices are going up and not enough homes are getting built. 
a growing number of millennials and Gen Z, the two generations still young enough for kids, are cohabitating more and more with their parents, and are also cohabitating with roommates that aren't their family. Regardless of people's threshold for adequate space, the amount of space available to young, potential parents is shrinking. If they can only afford a two-bedroom apartment in their city, they may not have that second or third kid just because they can't fathom where the crib will fit. And of all they can get is a studio, well, they may believe there's no room for a child at all. Again, not all people care about this, but I'm going to go on a limb and assume that enough people want a certain amount of space per child that this does affect their family size. I mean, there's been studies that show laws which require car seats for all children dissuaded parents from a third child, based on the fact that three car seats are a pain in the ass to manage. So, something far more detrimental like living space obviously is having an effect. Not only is this issue getting worse every year from the escalating rent, but more and more people are moving into cities around the world. Therefore, more and more people are entering the market for one bedroom and studio apartments. Less developed countries can send the kid back to grandpa's farm to grow up in the country, but the more developed a country is, the less likely that's a possibility. So what can a government do? Well, build more housing. Build lots of housing in places that have a lot of jobs around, and places young people want to live in. Build housing for every demographic. Build housing in every shape and every size. But housing development pisses off a lot of people with lobbying money, so I know governments are too scared to build. So, they can beat around the bush and do things like tax empty homes so the rich sell them to someone that will live there. Kick out Airbnb and short-term rentals. Offer discounts for first-time home buyers. They could even add better public transportation so people can comfortably live farther out of the cities. Lack of space is one of those problems that governments of the world can really tackle, and it would be a substantial benefit to their populace beyond just encouraging children. Alright, before I get into this, I want to say that no, Thanos was not right. Removing half of the population would not make the environment better for the surviving half. I also want to say that Malthus, a scholar from the 18th century, was wrong in the belief that the Earth has a limit to how many people it can support. Now I understand the law of thermodynamics and physics and biology. So yes, there is a limit to how many people can survive on this planet, but I don't think that number is 8 billion, or 10 billion, or even 20 billion. I think it's closer to 50 billion. Now that is a huge variance, but the low number is still well above any possibility we could reach. Demographers are saying we'll probably hit 10 billion people, and that's lower than a few decades ago when they thought we'd end up with 12 billion people. So what I'm saying is we aren't going to have to resort to soil and green. However, there is a caveat to my assumptions for human sustainability. And that is, the lower the human population, the lower our need for efficiency is. Or with less people comes less urban planning, less agricultural logistics, less budgetary planning, and less dependence of a brittle supply chain. And it's fair to say that your government is not equipped to handle the task. I mean, America is the wealthiest country in the world, yet there's plenty of people starving, even though grocery stores throw out a quarter of their food. But that's a topic for another time. To get back on track, the people crying out that they don't want to raise kids in a hellish world brought on by climate change probably are in a situation where they could compensate for the changing climate, or their governments can. Most of the world that's getting the short end of the stick have a large population or have only declined in births in the last 20 years. And even then, the global community has chipped in to help stymie the heating planet. However, I think all of us can agree that isn't enough, and every summer it seems like a new river has run dry. It really does feel like it's too late. But it's not too late. Ways to fight climate change is a topic for another video, but I will say that we have the power to address it. We can do something as drastic as build a giant space shade to block 10% of the sun, to something as simple as replacing open pit stoves in third world countries with something more efficient. The reason we're so held back is that there's a lot of rich people that benefit from the system as is, and is trying their dangdest to grab as much cash before the music stops. Also another topic for another video. And governments can shake more potential parents out of the doomer mindset by actually showing them some progress on the climate change war front. They can show that with projected models, the effort they're putting in is keeping the world from ending in 50 years. Man, it seems like if you want to convince people to have more kids, you should make the world a better place. I wonder if there's a lesson there. Anyway, on to money problems. If someone says they can't afford a child, they can't afford a child. Telling people they can, in fact, afford something is a tactic sleazy salesmen use. If someone is telling you there's more money in your wallet than you know, it's sound advice to turn around and walk away. 
They don't have your best interest at heart. But fine, people say this all the time, so let's see how many lattes, video games, and beers you need to cut for an infant. One single infant for one single year, and we're only doing continuous purchases because I'll be conservative and assume that all the big one-time items like cribs, strollers, and car seats will be covered by the baby shower. Diapers and wipes? 138 for two months. An okay deal, you might do better shopping around, but that comes to $828 for the year. Formula. This one's really cheap for my area, so if the infant can tolerate this, it comes to $20 for five days, which is $1,460 for the year. As they get bigger, they'll eat different foods, which varies wildly, but we'll say increase your food budget by around 10%. So at $150 a week for two people, add an extra $15 a week, which comes to $390 for half a year. Now clothes. From my experience, people tend to hand down baby clothes in the family, so it should be basically covered. However, it's not always enough due to people not anticipating things like jackets and gloves or hats and socks. So let's say you need to buy roughly one outfit a month because your abuela gave you all of your mother's infant clothes from the 60s. Jackets are a bit more expensive than this, so we'll round up to 25 a month. That's 300 bones a year. So that's 828 plus 1460 plus 390 plus 300 equals 2978 for the first year. If we exclude everything else like sunscreen, medicine, toys, and other accessories. So around 3k is the minimum to keep a little goblin alive. One $70 video game a month, oh jeez, they're $70 now, plus a $7 latte two days a week, and shaved $100 off your drinking habits, you'll have 2768 That's still 210 bucks shy of keeping it alive. Or let me rephrase this, 3k divided by 12 is 250 At the end of the month, do you have $250 in the bank account? And I'm lowballing this. Let me ask a better question. If you don't have something like $400 to $500 left over in your bank account every month, do you think you're not going to be stressed out about that child? Do you think reducing lifestyle expenses to the point that you might not end the month in the red is the right environment to build a family? I'm not saying only wealthy people should have kids, and I'm not saying children from a lower economic background can't have a happy and fulfilling childhood. What I am saying is cutting costs is not a permanent solution to supporting someone whose needs will radically change over two decades. Or TLDR, if someone says they can't afford a child, you believe them. Now would a government allowance provide enough to cover this situation? Yes, but 250 isn't going to cut it. The government would need to provide enough that the family doesn't just survive, but feels stable enough to cover expensive situations like replacing equipment and medicine for the illness of the child. Maybe double the amount, so 500 a month? Or 6,000 a year? And that is excluding everything else, like healthcare and daycare. Now we're getting to the expensive stuff. 11,750 is the average price for daycare in America. And I'm sure it's way more than 12K a year in your area. When you toss in rent, food, and transportation, it's not worth it to have daycare unless you're making at least 20 bucks an hour. Now, how many jobs are paying 20 bucks an hour starting off that doesn't require a college degree? But you're going to need more than $20 an hour if you're going to earn $20 an hour if you went to college, because student loans are going to pull hundreds of dollars out of you a month. And in Freedomville, you can't get rid of that debt with bankruptcy, because no money is no excuse for skipping out on your student loans. All right, another excellent strategy for the government to encourage more kids. Absolve student debt or make college more affordable, because the people most likely to have student debt are, coincidentally, the people of childbearing age. If someone graduates college at 22 with uh, 40k of debt, and then starts a job that pays them less than they're worth, it's going to take a few years to get their life in a position for more kids. And those few extra years will equate to one or two fewer children, because who can handle an infant at 45 or a toddler at 50? Bro, at 50, your back will hurt if your bedtime pillow isn't fluffed the right way. What makes you think you could handle carrying a squirming kid through a parking lot? So there, a government can pony up some dough for more kids. Or if they think that's icky for some reason, they can give incentives that makes life cheaper for younger adults. Off the cuff, I'd say it's worth 500 greenbacks, plus healthcare, plus student loan assistance, and or housing loan support, plus daycare subsidies. So economists, how many lattes a day does that add up to? Well, I've narrowed your choices down to five unthinkable options. Each will cause untold misery. I pick number three. You don't even want to read them first. I was elected to lead, not to read. 
Number three. So let's go over what a country needs to increase its fertility rate. Encourage the media to portray family life in a more positive light. Improve the work-life balance for their populace. Make homes for younger people, or at least make them affordable. Achieve their goals for climate change. Reverse the degradation of the planet and demonstrate that society will stabilize and even recover from whatever climate change has in store for us. Give parents money, either cash outright or a bunch of coupons to make kids cheaper. Make daycare more affordable. Now has any country done any of this? I mean, not all have done everything, but a few are in the ballpark. So I looked at 10 countries that are considered the best for family welfare and compared them to their birth rates. I looked at 10 because their recent history and economic situations would also affect their baby rates. So we're just trying to see if the welfare is paying off. Not all of them are the same, but I consider all of them generous on the world stage. I compared them to 10 countries with a great economy but low support for families. Some notes, I left out countries with small populations because they're too small to really know if the welfare is working. Also, the welfare states are the wealthier cohort, which I'm sure affects the results, but we don't have a perfect world where 10 undeveloped countries have great welfare. And finally, aside from the USA, all of these countries offer something in the way of family welfare and support because we don't live in a perfect world where 9 other rich countries blow their wealth on military domination instead of healthcare. We're sitting at 1.59 for the welfare states and 1.63 for the lesser welfare, but still chipping in countries. Now I did include Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, and you may argue they have distinct qualities that affect their natility rate. So I adjusted them out and added a few more countries. And I'm stretching to say that they're in the same league as the Europeans, but with Chile, Panama, and Cyprus, the new total is 1.86. The answer of whether a country can increase its birth rate through policy is... not really. It's not a yes, and it's not a no, but more on the side of the no answer. See, although the lesser welfare cohort has a higher number, that's really only due to one country, Israel. Now without Israel, their number is 1.48. And Israel has some amount of health care and welfare for families. Honestly, it checks a lot of boxes, with some in a weird way. The government chips in for a lot of childcare needs, and the history of the Jewish people, and Israel in particular, is one of a threat of annihilation. If they don't fight for what they got, it will be taken from them. So the doomer mentality that the world is going to end is trumped by the fact that their people will not survive without a larger demographic. That also covers feelings of annoyance with childbearing due to the nationalist bent they have. And before you comment, it's the orthodox community pumping kids. The birth rate for secular and educated women is high as well even if the Orthodox community is the highest. But Israel only has a population of just under 9 million. The high birth rate is only contributing to a couple extra 100,000 children maybe. Even with all the motivation in the world to have children, they no longer reach the three children per mother metric and will most likely decline like every other country in the world. This brings me to my thesis. And if you are going to forget about my video, this should be the thing you promise to commit to memory. It is that children are a luxury good. Let me repeat that. It is that children are a luxury good. If you understand that children belong in the same category as in-ground swimming pools, Ferraris, yearly international vacations, and cheese on your burgers, everything else falls into place. For example, imagine if your country gave subsidies for Italian sports cars. Imagine if they gave you reimbursement for buying one, they subsidized the expensive fuel for it, and they gave you a day of the week off to drive it around. You bet there would be a lot more people owning one, but you can probably think of people that still wouldn't get a sports car. Maybe they don't have the space to park it, or even with the welfare they still couldn't afford it. Or maybe they think cars are bad and don't want to own one on moral grounds. And Italian sports cars are basically toys much lower maintenance than a baby, yet they should still be in the same category. And if you tell me that children belong in the essential good category because they give you joy, self-actualization, and a purpose in life, I'll say, wow, that puts babies at the top two ranks of Maslow's hierarchy pyramid with all the other luxury goods. The essential goods are on the bottom, and they do things like feed you and keep you warm. And some of you might say that children are an investment for your retirement. And I'll reply, in what world are retirement funds not a luxury good? Most people on this planet are going to work until they die or work until they're disabled. Even if you started a farm in an industrialized country, I promise you, a tractor or a day laborer is cheaper. 
at least they don't take an investment of half a decade to become productive. Once you realize that children are a luxury, no amount of carrots can convince everyone in your community to have at least three for every generation. Resume the drill, Timmy, and do not do or say anything that a seven-year-old boy would not do or say. Feel free to consult the script I've prepared. Okay, but uh, it's a little stilted. I am feeling trepidation at the prospect of a parentless existence. No kid talks like that. Those lines were lifted verbatim from my boyhood diary. Resume the drill. All right. What if governments stop being nice and force people to have more children to boost the economy, regardless of if they want one or not? The jokes for this video are over. Any further humor will be at the expense of now deceased dictators. Please remove your silly glasses now. In 1967, the communist dictatorship of Romania was having a problem. Poverty was rampant, disease was spreading, and the industrial capacity of the country was floundering at best. Basically, the government could only expect to achieve modest growth for their state-mandated vision. Ceausescu and his yes-men looked to their Russian leaders and saw that they had millions of young people to integrate into the economy and achieve wondrous milestones like spaceflight. He then thought more workers equals more economy equals more money equals more power, and then decided that the Romanian population needed to explode. So with little warning, he passed Decree 770. Overnight, abortions were blocked outside of extreme circumstances, and contraceptives were outright banned. Women were ordered to provide invasive exams to prove that they weren't having abortions, and the state punished single people and smaller families with higher taxes. Big C said himself, the fetus is the property of the entire society. Anyone who avoids having children is a deserter who abandons the laws of natural continuity. The decree was oppressive, to say the least, but the Romanian population did increase, by at least an additional two million. The undeniable problem, though, was that the decree also increased the destitution and misery of the Romanian population, especially for those two million children. Additional classrooms weren't built, so children had to cram into classes of 40 or 50. Additional medical services weren't provided, so HIV spread to thousands of innocent children due to the sharing of needles. Agriculture couldn't keep up with the spike in demand, so starvation affected these children on a permanent psychological level, to the point that children born after this decree had noticeably smaller brain sizes and additional medical issues. The poverty of Romania couldn't support the needs of these families, so many struggled to support their additional children, much less provide a nurturing environment. And that was if the family decided to hold on to the additional children, for orphanages were overwhelmed at the hundreds of thousands of additional children that had been left there. These innocent kids were treated like prisoners for the crime of being born into a world of terrible policy decisions. And the mothers who were expected to shoulder the burden of these children suffered as well, the maternal mortality rate shot up as women found more desperate means of controlling their reproductive rights. Even women who earnestly wanted to have children faced problems as the medical system of the time failed to help complications due to overstraining. Romania's economy didn't take off from this event. And how could it? It takes roughly 15 years for a child to be ready to contribute meaningfully to an economy. By the time these children reached adulthood in the late 1980s, the Romanian economy was... a little worse than mediocre. And by the time these children entered the beginning of their prime wage earning period, the fall of the Soviet Union happened and the Romanian economy fell apart, pushing them into even worse standards of living. We don't have a portal to another world where Big C did not pass Decree 770, so we can't prove for certain what the economic impacts of this generation had, but it's safe to assume that they did not do much for the economy as children in the 1960s and 70s, and they could not do much during the austerity of the 1980s, and just when they could hit their stride, their economic model collapsed in the 1990s. All Decree 770 did for Romania was inflict an innocent generation to needless trauma. Hopefully, the pain these children endured could at least be a lesson for the rest of us to understand that the decision to have children should never involve more than those who will raise them. And there you have it. Thanks for watching my video. If you enjoyed what you saw, please like, share, subscribe. Leave a comment, uh, drink plenty of water, stay hydrated, make sure to stretch before you work out, and give me plenty of money in unmarked bills. Uh, never forget that children are a luxury good, and uh, don't pre-order games. Bye, love you.